Well, good morning to you. So good to be with you and to worship and praise God together. Appreciate those hymns that have been selected by Brother Norm and everyone who's taken a part in the service this Lord's Day and getting our minds focused, our hearts focused on where they need to be. And that's worshiping God in spirit and according to His truth. I invite you to take your Bibles out. Please be open to the book of Exodus. I'll be turning to chapter 4 there. Exodus chapter 4. Appreciate so much the presence of each one. We're blessed with visitors. We count you as honored guests. We hope you feel a very warm, friendly welcome as we desire you to experience when you're here at the Jerry Whitson Road Church of Christ. I'd like for us to consider this morning the Bible topic of emotions and the Christian life. Emotions and the Christian life. You know, discussing emotions and, and feelings, especially in this setting, I believe often causes the people of God maybe to feel a little bit uncomfortable, maybe a little bit awkward. I also believe because we see how so many who claim to be Christians go to extremes with expressing their feelings and emotions in ways that just simply do not harmonize with the will of God. That perhaps we go to the other extreme where we show little to no emotion or feeling regarding our relationship to God and with one another. And while we do not want to be on this side of the, the spectrum of emotionalism, it's just uncontrolled. We certainly don't want to divorce ourselves, separate ourselves so much from emotion that we find ourselves on the other extreme, just no emotion, where we're just stiff and stale and stoic and basically dead. But we need to seek a balance, brethren and friends, that is both that is biblical through and through. So e emotions, but not emotionalism. Emotion, and it's excited, enthusiastic, but there's, there's control there. And then of course, again, rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. And so I, I believe an appropriate right place for us to begin our study on this subject is with looking to God looking to our Creator. So, what about God? Does He have emotions? Does He have feelings? What do the Scriptures reveal to us on this subject? Well, of course, throughout the Bible, we do read of the emotions of God, the feelings of God. We read of His anger. He feels anger, even toward his child and servant Moses here in Exodus chapter 4 as God is commissioning Moses to go stand before Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And we see throughout chapters 3 and 4 Moses offering all these excuses to God why he is not the right man for the job. And finally, Moses says to, to the Lord in verse 13 of Exodus 4, but uh, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Any, send anybody but me, basically. Verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. We see God's anger many times, of course, throughout Scripture. We also, though, read of His laughter. Think about that. We probably don't oftentimes think about God and laughter, but... There are some Psalms and Proverbs that refer to the laughter of God. We read, of course, of the compassion of our God. And we read very early on in our Bibles that He grieves. Of course, He grieves over sin. Remember, He grieved in His heart, Genesis 6, that He had made man. It was sorry. It had made man because of the depth of sin and wickedness that his creation had reached. We see that he loves. He loves. In fact, of course, John would later write in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. That's a defining characteristic of God. 
and he hates. Of course, he hates wickedness. We read in these verses, these passages, Psalms and Proverbs. And we know that he feels jealousy. He identifies himself in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 as a jealous God, right? That's one of the main reasons given why Israel was not to go worship and serve and make other gods and bow down to them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. We read also of his joy. He has joy, and that's expressed in a number of passages, and there's a few of them, but clearly we can see that there's plenty of evidence on the pages of the Bible that God has emotions, that he has feelings that he expresses. Well, what about his son, Jesus Christ? You know, in John chapter 14, when Jesus was offering his disciples comfort, let not your heart be troubled. And he had said some things that certainly had, that were upsetting to them, that he would be leaving them, and where he was going, they could not come, but he was letting them know, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again, that you may be where I am also. And he also mentions there in John chapter 14, that uh, where I go you know, the way you know. Remember Thomas is the one who said in, in verse 5 of John 14, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And you remember the re re memorable response when Jesus said to him, I am the way, right? I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then in verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. I kind of bewildered them, and Philip spoke up and said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Well, what did Jesus say to that? Verse 9, Jesus said to them, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? There's a unity, there's a oneness, the Godhead, and the Father, and the Son. And so when we look briefly and highlighted those emotions or feelings of God revealed to us in, in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, even though we mainly cited some Old Testament Scriptures, when we see that in the Heavenly Father, guess what we're going to see in His Son, Jesus Christ? Well, the same. And so think about when here's God in the flesh, right? God manifested in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Born of woman in due season, Galatians 4.4. 4. What do we see in Christ? Well, he felt anger, right? The hardness of their hearts when we, and the rulers of, of, of the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees, Mark 3.5, he, he felt anger. And in John chapter 2, would you say Jesus expressed any emotions there? You know what I'm referring to in John 2, 14 through 6? That's when he cleansed the temple. When he saw what was going on in his father's house, how they made it a, 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 a house of, of merchandise, a place where you go shop and sell. and buy. There was the money exchangers there, there on the temple grounds. There were those who were selling sheep and oxen. And again, there's a, there was a right place for that, but not at that location. You got Jews traveling in to worship God at the time of the Passover from all over the Roman Empire. Yeah, they needed to exchange money, but not there. They're going to have to be offering sacrifices, the law of Moses commanded. They needed those animals, and maybe many of them didn't travel with animals, but they can get them when they arrived there, but not there was that supposed to take place. And so Jesus made a whip of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple and with the sheep and the oxen. He, notice he, he poured out the changers' money. Can you try to imagine that, picture that in your mind? Overturned the tables, money, and just going everywhere, all the noise and just driving all that, them out, and the animals out, and, and saying to those who sold doves, take these things away. 
You think he whispered it? Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Well, the disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your houses, eat me up. We see any emotions, you think, here in Christ? Oh, yeah. And he didn't keep them in. He expressed them. This is righteous indignation. How many times do we see his compassion? Where he was moved with compassion. And it wasn't just he, he felt something. He, he had those emotions. He had those feelings. And it moved him to do something. Whether it was healing. Whether it was teaching. Whether it was feeding. Those who were with him in the multitudes and hadn't had food in some time. We read of his joy. John 15, 11, John 17, 13, the joy that he wanted his disciples to have as well. We also read of his sorrow. One of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture is two words, Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35. And to me, one of the things that's so profound about that text is that, of course, Jesus' good friend Lazarus has died by the time he arrives in Bethany. He's been in the grave four days. But Jesus knew he was going to raise up his friend from the dead. He's the resurrection of life, as he declared to Martha, his sister. And yet, he's moved with compassion as he sees uh, the family and the friends of the family, they're crying, they're weeping. He, he sees that. He's stirred in the spirit and Jesus wept. God in the flesh wept. Of course, he loved in that same text. It speaks of his love for Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He loved his own till the end. John 13, 1, that text where he will arise after supper, gird himself with a towel, and begin to wash his disciples' feet. Of course, he was filled with love, and he expressed that. It moved him to action. And, and he felt agony, as we read in Luke 22, verse 44, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke, the beloved physician, the doctor who wrote that, Gospel and the things that Luke brings out that's unique to his gospel speaks of the agony that Jesus had. He felt frustration. He felt frustration again with his disciples at times with their lack of faith. Oh, you a little faith. He felt troubled. John 11. 33, troubled in his spirit, John 12, 27. And since he came in the flesh, guess what? When he traveled and he was weary like we get, and he felt weariness at Sychar of Samaria, sat down by the well to rest. And we see how he felt amazement. Sometimes it was at the faith such as the centurion of Matthew 8.10. I haven't found such great faith, not even all of Israel, as he found in the centurion. Or his amazement at the unbelief of his own people that he came to the Jews, the hardness of their heart, despite the signs and miracles and wonders that he performed. You know, there's a very good reason why all of us possess emotions and feelings. And of course, it's because we have been made in the image of Almighty God. Now, I did not tell Camden to emphasize this, but I appreciate the emphasis he gave when he read. Then God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. Did you notice that? He gave emphasis to our image, our likeness. And it was contrasted with the verses that came before it as he made the cattle, the animals. That's not said about them. It's said about you and me. It's said about us, male and female. 
So God created man in his own image, the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. I get, a lot of, I get in a lot of spiritual conversations with folks at the gym. Just this past week, there's an older gentleman named Charlie. And Charlie's, Charlie's in his 80s, I think upper 80s. But he's very inquisitive. He's always, he said, I'm always thinking. I'm always questioning things and asking questions. I said, well, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. And he likes to ask me questions. He said, ah, come over here. I want to ask you something. So... Genesis 1 says that, or the Bible says that, let us make man our own image. Who's the us there? So we talked about that. So, well, that's the, you know, the Hebrew word there is, is Elohim. And you got the God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit all involved in creation and what the New Testament says about Christ and nothing was made it was made without him, and so we talked about that. And he said, well, what, a, what does that mean in our image? I said, well, you know, the one, for, one of the first things that comes to my mind, Charlie, is that God is spirit. He's not flesh, the Bible says. God has given us a spirit. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, when we die, our spirit returns to God who gave it. We've got an eternal, eternal soul or spirit that he's given us. And I said, beyond that, you know, the Bible makes a distinction between us and everything else God created. And that we can reason and think, making decisions and free will and that God has given us. And we have emotions and feelings. And I talked about that. And so, certainly we should not divorce or separate ourselves just all together. And even when we come for worship and living our lives from what God has given us, and we look at God, and we see Him expressing this. We look to the Son, and we're to, we're to be like the Son, and we see Him expressing these emotions and feelings during His earthly ministry. It's just that the balance is, of course, always being rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. Not out of control, but within the parameters of what we find in Scripture. You know, the Apostle Paul serves as a wonderful example, I believe, to illustrate this, this truth, this point. You consider the emotions, the feelings of Paul. He writes in the second epistle to the Corinthian church that he, he felt concern. You know, in, in that chapter, back around verse 22 of 2 Corinthians 11, he begins to kind of chronicle, highlight a n- number of the trials that he had, had gone through as a preacher as an apostle of Christ, the sufferings. But it's interesting when he, he talks about the, 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 the stonings, the beatings, the shipwrecks, all the different dangers and trials. You get to verse 28 and he says, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? What comes upon me each and every single day? My deep concern for all the churches. My deep concern. He felt concern. And sometimes I make that distinction when we talk about the subject of worry and anxiety. God says don't do that. Jesus says don't do that. But I think it's right and proper to have concern about things. Okay? Don't, let it, don't be filled with anxiety. Don't be anxious for anything, the Bible tells us, Philippians 4, 6. But it's right and proper if we care about other people and Paul cared for his brethren in every place. Every day he was concerned for them. But guess what he did for them as well? He prayed for all those brethren in every place. He prayed for their spiritual uh, faithfulness and growth. But also in the very next verse, what did he feel? He felt indignation. He felt indignation. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? The New King James Version reads. Maybe yours reads a little differently. Well, that's that righteous indignation again that we spoke of with Jesus in John chapter 2 when he cleansed the temple. Indignation, anger. He felt fear, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, when he came to Corinth, that corrupt city. He says, I was with you in much fear and trembling. That's where the Lord would strengthen him in Acts 18. 
appeared to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Do not keep silent, for I'm with you. That harmonizes well with what he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, that he had fear, trembling. He felt joy. Even, by the way, Philippians, while he was in prison, that's where he was when he sent that epistle. And over and over in those four chapters, he talks about joy and rejoicing, rejoice always, right? Speaks of his joy. But he also felt sorrow, as we've studied in the adult class in the book of Romans. He felt great sorrow in his heart, continual sorrow in his heart for what? His brethren in the flesh, Jews who had rejected Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, had not come to Jesus for salvation. He was annoyed and provoked. You remember there was a certain slave girl filled with the spirit of divination that was following Paul and his companions in Philippi, crying out, these are servants of the Most High. God kept doing that. Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and rebuked that spirit, evil spirit came out of her. Then the masters got upset, the masters of that slave girl that they were using for their financial gain led to their imprisonment, being beaten and imprisoned. But when he came to the city of Athens, Greece, when he saw a city that was given over to idolatry, paganism, what did it do? It provoked him in a spirit, it said. And he didn't just, you know, those feelings led to him what? Led to him teaching and preaching in the synagogues and the marketplace and eventually at Mars Hill, the Areopagus. There's things that ought to annoy us. Provoke us. Now, there's things that ought not to annoy us and provoke us that we so easily get annoyed by and provoke. But there are good things for those feelings to be stirred within us. We also read how he felt peace and calm. Even with the prospect of facing imprisonment and even death, he says, but none of these things move me. Right? But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. In the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Of course, he felt love. Lord willing, pretty soon the men will be, in our men's study, will be beginning our next study in 2 Corinthians. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. You see emotions and feelings so far in that verse? That not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love with which, which I have so abundantly for you. So we have affliction or tribulation, anguish of heart, many tears, grieved but then the abundance of love that Paul had for his brethren. So what about us? What about you and me? What about our emotions or feelings in the life of a Christian? Well, what about being filled with joy? That's a fruit of the Spirit. It's supposed to be characteristic of our life. Did Norm lead us in a song, Joyful Pilgrim? Over and over, every verse. Speaks of the joy that the child of God, the pilgrim, this world's not our home, that we ought to have where we're headed, who we're living for. Filled with joy. John wrote in 1 John 1, 4, these things we write that your joy may be full. What do we read in Romans 12, 15? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. With our brothers and sisters in Christ. About an attitude and feelings, a disposition of hate. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. But when it comes to sin, evil and sin and error, we are like God to have His attitude and His feelings toward that hatred. Not for the sinner, but for the, for the sin, for the error. We are to love. Ephesians 1, 5, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, we're to fill it and express it. We are to be compassionate just like God and just like His Son. We're compassionate. We noted we are to be compassionate. Hebrews 10, 34, 1 Peter 3, 8, we are to show compassion towards one another. The text reads, 
We are to be, Romans 12, 11, fervent in spirit as we serve the Lord. We read of Apollos being described as one who is fervent in spirit. That's a strong uh, feeling. At times we will feel anxious. And when we do, as we noted earlier, we're, we're not to be. We're to pray to God about that. We're to cast our cares, our anxieties upon Him, knowing He cares for us, 1 Peter 5, 7. You know, at other times we might even fear, feel fearful. When Saul of Tarsus obeyed the gospel but came to Jerusalem for the first time, the disciples were afraid, afraid of him. They didn't believe he was really one of them. You know, Barnabas had to speak up on his behalf. And there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 and 5, When we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Wait a second, Paul felt afraid at times? Yep. It's his own pen. He wrote it. I did. You didn't. Text says it. He says, outside were conflicts. Inside of us were fears. And he overcame them and pushed, pressed through them with the Lord strengthening. But, and there's feelings of contentment and peace and weariness and discouragement and thankfulness. So what sort of emotions ought Christians to show on a regular basis in our lives? Well, we've noted one already, but joy. But let, let's hit some sp specific areas. There in Acts 8 and verse 39, we ought to have joy in our conversion. After Philip preached the gospel, preached Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch, he understood it, was ready to obey what he heard and believed. He was baptized. And to Christ came up out of the water, he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Why? His sins have been washed away. He had received salvation. He was a child of God. He had the hope of heaven. He was no longer lost and dead in his trespasses and sins. Or as Jesus speaks of throughout Luke chapter 15, when one sinner repents, what happens? The angels rejoice. Heaven rejoices. We rejoice here on earth when one sinner is restored unto faithfulness, unto God. When we assemble to worship God with the saints, Psalm 122, verse 1, David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We should be glad every time we have the opportunity to come here and other places to assemble with God's people to worship. Joyful to praise God when we sing is anyone cheerful? James said what? Let him sing. Psalms, right? James 5.13. Should we be joyful when we give? God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9.7. And even joyful in our tribulation. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 4. We should have sorrow though when we repent. Because godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted. 2 Corinthians 7.10. Remember the tax collector, the publican who went up to the temple to pray, beat his breast, oh God be merciful to me, a sinner. There's joy and it's appropriate in many settings and situations, but when we sin there ought not to be any joy. There ought to be sorrow, godly sorrow. We are to be zealous for good works. Again, we can't divorce ourselves for any, from just emotions when it comes to being zealous. Not out of control. But, you know, that's the same root word as fervent, being fervent in spirit earlier, Romans 12, 11, And it means to be hot, to boil, to have warm, watch it now, feelings. To have warm feelings. We're to have anger, anger towards sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, Ephesians 4, 26. You remember what we said about Paul? He says, if someone's made to stumble, I burn with indignation, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. As we pointed out earlier in Romans 12, 15, we're to weep for those who are suffering. We are to, to sympathize and, if possible, empathize with them. If we've gone through something similar in our life, we're members of one another. We're connected. We, we share in the, the ups and the downs, the, the joys and the sorrows of one another in the body of Christ. The hatred that we're to have for sin and error, 
as our Heavenly Father and our Savior does. The love that we are to have in our hearts and to be expressed in words and actions towards our brethren, with, be kindly affectionate with, with one, with, to one another with brotherly love. And, and think about even an emotional response that's appropriate to God's Word. That's, it's living and it's powerful and it's sharper to, than any two-edged sword. And it, what does it do? It pierces even to the division of soul and morrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Have you, have you ever been moved to tears by God's Word? I know that you have, many of you have. Maybe all of us hopefully at some point in time and maybe we're not criers but maybe our eyes fill with tears or we just, it moves us to emotion. I don't think that's a, a wrong thing. I think that's a good thing when it comes to the powerful Word of God. When you read about what they did to Jesus, the crucifixion, what He went through, I think there's a problem if we're not moved in kind of feeling or emotion about that. Our feelings of, uh, of guilt, that's appropriate. Well, don't make me feel guilty. Well, if we're in sin, following error, we need to feel guilty about that and, and no, no longer do that. Uh, God's Word, uh, feeling hopeful or feeling dread and fear, feeling grateful, feeling motivated, feeling comfort and, and, and a peacefulness. But let us understand and be accepting to the truth that emotions and feelings are God-given. Let us avoid extremes and seek balance in regard to our emotions that are biblically sound. You know, as with any other biblical subject, search the scriptures to find the truth and then uphold that truth in our lives. You know, while truth is certainly not determined by our feelings, we, need, we indeed ought to feel very strongly about the truth as revealed in the Word of God and then hold fast to it. We walk by faith, not by feelings. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We do not base our faith in Jesus Christ upon our feelings, but upon the Word of God that's been revealed, Romans 10, 17. However, we must recognize this in the, the important and godly role that emotions have in the life of a child of God of all New Testament Christians. And if you're not yet a New Testament Christian but lost in sin, then dear friend, you need to feel guilt and you need to feel sorrow, godly sorrow for your sins. Be cut to the heart as those on the day of Pentecost were when they heard the truth of the gospel, Acts 2, 37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then believe. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Be willing to repent of your sins. Be willing to confess your faith in Him, the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead. Be willing to come forward and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And then you, like the Ethiopian eunuch, can go on your way rejoicing and praising God and growing in your love for Him, your faith and knowledge of Him and telling others about the salvation that's only found in Him. If you are a child of God but there's sin in your life, then... Feel godly sorrow about that and turn back to God. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, let it be known as we stand and as we sing.